Aloha, this is Roger Brewer with the Hawaii Department of Health. This is a recording of a presentation I gave to the U.S. EPA Incremental Sampling Committee, August 3, 2017, titled Discrete Soil Sample Reliability and the Need to Transition to Multi-Increment Sampling Methods. This is very similar to work presentations that we've given at other workshops over the past one or two or three years. But there's some new ideas included in this based on discussions we, we had, and there's always something new to learn. So what I want to do today is, is start off back at the beginning. One problem I think we missed in some of the early workshops through ITRC and other groups on incremental sampling methodology or a different terminology used is we never really had the data to discuss and point out the specific problems with discrete soil samples. That's something our office went out and did two or three years ago. We should have done it 25 years ago, which I'll go over in this presentation. We collected hundreds of co-located samples, looked at variability between discrete soil samples, and get a much better idea of exactly how reliable the data or unreliable the data are. The main guidance, the background for this presentation is Hawaii's Decision Unit Multi-Increment Sample Site Investigation uh, document, recently updated 2016. There's three main sections in the document to discuss what we call DUMIS Site Investigation Methods. Section 3 discusses systematic planning, or basically how you set up a site investigation from, from beginning to end. And there we talk about the concept of decision units, which is really nothing new. We're not going to talk about decision units much in this presentation, but it's, it's suspect areas of contamination or even suspect clean areas where we want to collect samples. Section 4 discusses decision unit or DU characterization with respect to sampling theory. And this is where we discuss differences between traditional discrete sampling methods and problems with that, those approaches that we're really focused on in this presentation. And also we get into more detail on sampling theory and multi-increment sampling methods. Section 5 in the guidance discusses field implementation. We've tested several thousand sites now in Hawaii. Also talk quite a bit with people in the mainland U.S. and other places doing DUMIS type approaches. And this is just a compilation of experience in the field from them. How do you designate these in the field? How do you mark them off? How do you collect soil samples in soft soil versus hard packed gravelly soil? What kind of tools and such do you need? How long does it take? And even how much does it cost? So we've, we've uh, just completed a series of webinars on each one of these topics. And they're, uh, in the last few weeks, they're posted to our webinar webpage, both recorded webinars, links to YouTube, and the PowerPoint presentations. And anyone listening, you're free to use the PowerPoint presentations as needed. No need to get any kind of uh, approval from us. So what we're going to focus today on is discrete sampling methods. A great quote from Albert Einstein, if I had one hour to solve the problems of the world, I would spend 59 minutes on explaining the problem and one minute on explaining the answer. That's pretty much what we're going to do today. And then a great quote also from Dr. Seuss, sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are easy. So DUMIS, multi-increment sampling approaches, in the field it's pretty obvious. It, collecting, physically collecting the sample can be challenging sometimes, but the, the concept and the approach is pretty easy. Uh, the sampling theory behind that can be, seem very complicated, and it is to initially to catch on. So today what I want to talk about is a, a field study Hawaii completed a few years ago. We just published a paper in this, this year uh, on discrete sample variability. So this is published in the Journal of Soil and Sediment Contamination. Part 1 discusses the field study results. We went out to three sites about to show you collected hundreds of discrete samples side by side and had them tested by laboratory, even had laboratory tests dozens of individual samples multiple times to look at variability within samples. That's in part one. Part two just discusses the implications of the, the small scale random variability that we see in discrete soil sample data. The field report and re recorded webinars are posted to the HERA webpage. And again, the recorded webinars we posted to our YouTube channel. Let's start back at the beginning. Why do we collect soil samples in the first place? There's two reasons, and I, my background actually is in geology, so kind of the site investigation side of the environmental work. And also I've been trained as a risk assessor. So two different potential goals in the field of collecting samples. The first is to estimate the extent of contamination that might pose an environmental concern. This could be direct exposure risk, ecological risk, Leaching of contaminants from soil impacts to groundwater. That's a big issue in Hawaii. Gross contamination, 
or soil that say contaminated with petroleum to such a degree that it, it could cause really extensive vapor problems when it's disturbed in the field or even catch on fire has happened to one site I worked on once. And the second reason to collect soil samples from the risk assessment side is just to estimate the true, also referred to as the mean concentration of contaminant for a targeted area and volume of soil. And this then the data are, are used for comparison to screening levels or in risk assessments. At one point we're not going to talk about in this particular presentation I did in other presentations discrete soil sample data were never intended to be compared to individual soil screening levels. We're always going to look we're always looking for the true concentration of the mean concentration for some targeted area and compare that to screening levels for use in risk assessment. Another point to keep in mind all data for a particular matter like soil represents an average. Laboratories might test a pinch or a spoonful of soil for lead or some other contaminant if they tested individual particles, they might get a completely different number. The number they report to you for the mass they tested is just an average of all that particulate matter that they extracted and tested. So that's a key point to remember. Uh, the objective is always, again, just to estimate the true concentration of the contaminant, not only in the sample you submit to the laboratory, but also for the area that the sample is intended to represent in the field. So I worked quite a bit with Dina Crumling at USC EPA headquarters who provided lots of uh, original documents written in the 1980s, 1990s, published by US EPA on the origin of discrete soil sampling methods. Now we were really wondering why did, was this method where you're essentially testing soil one spoonful at a time developed in the first place? If you look back at the original documents, <coughs> here's two quotes, 1985, verification of PCB, spill cleanup, some of the key assumptions that they were including. When they brought up these assumptions too, they, if you read the details, they knew that this, this may not be true, but this is what they had time to publish. They assumed that people would look at it in more detail later, maybe not 30 years later. But 1985, the implicit assumption that contamination is likely to be uniformly present anywhere within the sampling area is reasonable. 1989, methods for evaluating the attainment and cleanup standards. When there is little distance between points, it is expected that there will be little variability between points. Here they're talking about co-located samples. Now they're writing this guidance. No one had ever actually gone out in the field to test these assumptions, which is something to think about. And we should have done it when I started work back in the 1990s. That's how they came up with the grid and discrete sample approach. The idea was that the concentration of a contaminant in the release media, like waste water, say, coming out of an industry, is reasonably assumed to be uniform. As long as the process within that factory, that industry didn't change, then the waste coming out of it. It might be say, discharged into a field to be reasonably uniform. So you can test any mass, any time, and get the same number. The only, the, the main call for the mass you need to, to collect then was just whatever the laboratory needed to test. Now under this assumption, which was quite reasonable at the time, this, the assumption in, with respect to soil was that the concentration of contaminant in soil should likewise be fairly similar. And again, you can test any mass of soil, any or any volume from anywhere within a spill area and get pretty much the same number. So if you see on the grid the figure on the left, APA 1985, which is a PCB guidance, that the circled areas are intended to represent spill areas. So you set up your grid so you get at least one sample within a spill area. And based on the estimated or assumed size of the spill area, it'll tell you how far apart your grid was. If you get one sample in the spill area, you'll catch it. That was the assumption. <coughs> And then you can determine if that area, surrounding area, was clean or contaminated. So again, the exact location and mass of the soil collected wasn't critical as long as it was within that area to begin with. Just collect what the lab needs. This was the origin of four ounce jars that had nothing to do with science in the field. That's just what the lab needed for to get enough mass of soil to test. Well, how's that working for you, as Dr. Phil might say? This is definitely reflects a lot of my experience the first half of my career. It's a need for multiple remobilizations and step out investigations. This is what creates brownfields, it, much more than the cost associated with, with cleaning up a site. It's the uncertainty after a, a business or property owner is paid for multiple times you know, for consultant to go out and collect soil samples or discrete soil samples at a site. They identify some contamination, they dig it up, they excavate it, collect confirmation samples, and and surprise, surprise, they have to do more excavation. So failed confirmation samples, multiple over-excavations, 
all the uncertainty tied into these investigations is what caused the sites to be finally abandoned by the, the responsible party. A big problem we've had in Hawaii too is accidental import or export of contaminated soil where they've gone out to a you know, large area of contaminated soil, collected a, essentially a few spoonfuls from different spots, few discrete samples, tested it, looked clean enough, imported into a site, someone retested it later and found contamination. So what's going on here? And you ever wonder, and anybody who's ever done any field work, let's say has thought these exact same things, what if I move my sample point over a few feet? Would I really get the same number? Is it really contamination really that uniform? Or in the laboratory, what if the lab tested a different subsample or aliquot of soil? Would they get the same number? Sometimes you might get your, your jars back from the laboratory, or at least in the report, it says the sample was homogenized. It, Talk to a laboratory chemist about homogenizing soil. As one person told me, try sticking a small metal rod in a four ounce jar of dirt and, and stirring it around. And they, laboratories have known for, for decades that the data they were giving you wasn't representative of the sample that you sent them. Because you can't homogenize particulate matter, especially at the, at the mass that they're testing. If anything, when you stir it, then the, the fines are probably going to settle down to the bottom. The coarser material comes up to the top, and they take a pinch off the top, and that's what they test. Something that struck me, which I never thought about until I started looking at this more detail, for metals, laboratories only test a half a gram to one gram of soil. So you see in the figure compared to a penny, it's just a pinch of soil is all the lab tests out of that jar that you sent them. Now, just for comparison, a pack of sugar in a restaurant has two or three or four or so grams of sugar in it. So imagine that tiny mass of soil the lab's testing where you collected that sample from, what's the chance it's really re representative of the area where you collected it from, much less the, or even the, the soil in the jar that you sent them. VOCs, they only test five grams of soil. That's enough soil to put into a, a bottle cap of a soda bottle or something. So think about that when you go out and spend a lot of money collecting VOC, uh, collecting samples to test for VOCs. You're really just scattering a few soda bottle caps around your site, and that's what you're testing. How representative you think that really is? The soil would have to be contaminants have to be extremely uh, uniform in soil for it to be representative. PCBs, pesticides, dioxins, TPH, PHs, other chemicals, they laboratories typically test 10 to 30 grams. So now you're getting up to a spoonful or even a large spoonful of soil. But still think about the area where you collected it from. How many potential spoonfuls were there within that area to collect? What's the chance the one you happened to the lab happened to test for the sample you sent is representative? Well, that's what we wondered. So a couple of years ago, we used some of the money, grant money we get from EPA Region 9. We typically use 5 to 10% of our grant money every year to carry out these type of small-scale research projects in the field, specific problems we're dealing with. So in this case, we picked three known contaminated sites where site A we knew was contaminated with arsenic, site B, lead, site C, PCBs. At each site, we designated 24 grid points, and then we collected hundreds of co-located discrete samples at each site. And then we also had the lab test each sample, I'll show you in a minute, and we also had the lab test individual samples multiple times to get variability within individual samples. And we collected multi-increment triplicate samples from the same areas just for comparison. So site A was a site, fine-grained soils contaminated with arsenic and wastewater from a a former factory that used to make arsenic-infused wood as a, to prevent termite damage to wood. This one we expected the lowest variability because it was wastewater and it was fine-grained soils. Site B is another site. Again, all these sites we had discrete sample data for. We knew they were contaminated. This, in this case, is a former municipal incinerator. They'd taken ash from the incinerator, mixed it with fill material, and used it to fill in the site. Here we expected to see more variability at the arsenic site. If you looked at the soil real carefully and knew what to look for, you'd see little pockets a few millimeters across of ash mixed in with the soil. So we knew if, if you happen to test a pocket of ash, you'd get a much higher concentration of lead than you would if you happen to test a small pocket the side of it of fill material. But again, we didn't know how what we didn't have any idea what the quantitative variability was. That's the main reason for doing this study. Site C, former radio transmitter site, and we knew it's contaminated PCBs. PCBs are infamous for failed confirmation samples and really high variability, and that's exactly what the, the discrete data at this site showed us. So each site, 24 grid points, and lots of discrete samples. Here's what we did. Then we wanted to look at variability between what we'd call co-located samples as well as variability within samples. 
Co-located samples in our study report, we refer to this as inter-sample variability. Each of the 24 grid points at each site, we collected five discrete samples, two to 300 grams each, from a one square meter area around the grid point. Now we want to know as closely as possible what the true concentration was of the target contaminant in that sample. So we had the laboratory process these using multi-increment sampling methods or incremental sampling methods and then test it for the target metal. In this case, we're using arsenic and heat lead. <coughs> so that, that gave us an idea of inter-sample variability around individual grid points. We also want to look at the variability within a, a single sample. We refer to this as intra-sample variability. In this case, for the lead and arsenic sites, we took one of the discrete samples that we used for the co-located samples, collected it as undisturbed as possible, and then had someone associated with laboratory test it with a portable XRF. They would shoot the sample five times on top of the container, then they flip it over or flip it out of the container and test the bottom five times. Looked at variability within the individual samples. The XRF is testing about a gram of soil, very similar to the mass tested by laboratory. Of course, we couldn't use an XRF for PCBs. So for the looking at interest sample variability for PCBs, we took a, a six single sample, about uh, several hundred grams, but then we split it into 10 separate jars, and we had the laboratory test each individual jar for PCBs. And this gave us an idea of what the variability within a single discrete sample the laboratory receives might be. So let's look at the results. And uh, what we predicted it, it was exactly what we saw in the data. So this is the arsenic site. We saw very low variability, at least in terms of compared to other sites, between concentration of arsenic recorded for individual discrete samples. In this case, grid point number two, looking at variability between the co-located samples. Again, these were all processed, subsampled, and tested, so these should be good data for individual samples. 140 but see the lowest concentration at this particular grid point, 120 milligrams per kilogram. About a foot or so away, 260 milligrams per kilogram. Now if you see a little bit over two-fold variability, if you look at the average for the variability within a sample and the variability between co-located samples, this is actually about what you see, an average of two-fold variability. So any one of the grid points at this site, if you collected a discrete sample, then, the, and then went back later on and collected another discrete sample, within a foot or even a few inches away, you might see an average of two-fold variability between the samples. It's actually not that much, as you'll see in a minute, from a field standpoint. Tell that to a, a risk assessor. Well, it's either 120 ppm or it might be 260 ppm. Well, which is it? Here's the lead-contaminated site. And as predicted again, this is where we had lead-contaminated ash mixed with soil. We saw an increase in variability between co-located discrete samples. In this particular Grid point, lowest concentration we found in the processed discrete samples, 120 milligrams per kilogram. Highest concentration, again, just a foot away, 300 milligrams per kilogram. Now, if we look at the average variability or total variability, looking at uh, variability between co located samples and variability within a single sample, average total variability is about seven fold. You know, some of the grid points, it was much higher than that, some it was lower. This was just the average. This is probably a good number to use in the field if you're wondering how much your discrete sample data varies. It's kind of conservative, or maybe not. If I move my discrete sample point over a foot, how different might the number be? So think about that fivefold, something in that range, and the difference that might make in your decisions on site investigation, even risk assessment. The lead site was, was really curious because Hawaii's lead screening level, just by chance, is 200 milligrams per kilogram. So at every single grid point at the lead contaminated site, we could collect a discrete sample that was, and it, would, it could come out below 200 ppm, and we could collect discrete samples that could come out above 200 ppm. So we could collect a set of discrete samples from all 24 grid points, and they all come back clean, below 200 ppm. Someone else might go back later, collect a brand new set of discrete samples at the exact same grid points, maybe offset a few inches, and every sample come back over 200 ppm. This is an example from the PCB study site. This was the most variable grid point that we saw. So if you look at this, the five co-located samples first, lowest concentration of PCBs at this site, 4.9 ppm, highest concentration in the bottom right, 91 ppm, just a foot or two away. Now these increases and decreases you see in 
con contaminant concentrations around grid point are totally random. As you go from 4.9 to the 91, it doesn't mean that PCB concentration is increasing in that direction. If you go a foot past the 91 ppm, you might get 5 ppm. You might get ND. So these numbers are completely random within this one meter square area. Now let's look at the sixth sample that we took at the PCB sites. In this case, we took it and split it into 10 separate jars. The mean concentration for each jar individual subsample is 2400 ppm. So at this single grid point here, the, the variability within discrete samples within the one square meter area was almost 500 fold. Average variability between all of the, for all of the grid points at the site in total about 39 fold. So think about that. You collect a discrete sample at this site, it might come back 0.5 ppm. Collect another one a few inches away, it might come back 20 ppm or it might come back you know, 120th to 0 0.5, 0 0.1 or something. So that's how much variability we see around these. So the discrete sample data individually can be highly misleading, really completely meaningless for that grid site. Key point to point out here, and we saw this at the other sites too, the variability wasn't necessarily dependent on the concentration. We'd see the same type of vari level or degree of variability within individual uh, grid points, even when the concentration was down below a PPM or in the PPB level. So let's look at this grid point in more detail. This, this is the sample that we took and split into 10 separate jars and had the laboratory test each jar. Lowest concentration of PCBs that could have been reported for this sample, 810 ppm. Highest concentration, again, within the same sample, 5700 ppm. So the average here, again, was 2400 ppm. The average variability we saw what, within samples, 17 fold. Maximum variability we saw within a single sample, over 100 fold. And again, this isn't necessarily concentration dependent. We see the same variability at the PPB level. So what's going on here? But if we looked at these samples from the site in more detail under a microscope, and what we suspect, we're actually highly confident of, is we have these PCB-infused tar balls. So this PCB oil was dumped onto the ground. It would beat up, sink into the soil, and eventually dry up and turn into these little PCB-infused tar balls or nuggets. And these are just a few millimeters across. Look at the bottom right. This is a sample. And it, there's a lot of lithic fragments in here, pieces of basalt that are dark. But if you look at some of them, they're easily crushable, easily broken. And these definitely weren't pieces of rock. You zoom in in the upper left-hand corner, then you can see what's something about the size of a, a tic-tac, if you're familiar with that, of just a millimeter or so across. They look like, if you live in tropical environments, I like to say, they look like roach eggs. But you see this outer thin rim that's lighter colored and then a dark, silty matrix in between. So these are little droplets of PCB oil that sank into the soil and dried up into tar balls. Key points to think about here is the concentration of PCBs or any contaminant in a sample you send in is totally dependent on the mass of soil tested. If the laboratory had tested the, the entire mass of soil on the bottom right as a single sample, they could extract it or a subsample, they probably would have gotten several PPM PCBs in it, maybe even tens of PPM. If they were taking one of these small tar balls and tested them, test just it, then they, they could have easily gotten maybe several hundred or even several thousand ppm of PCBs. In the upper left, if you could zoom in with uh, an electron microprobe or something, you actually report PCBs, which of course they can't. Zoom in on the matrix and test a tiny, tiny spot within that matrix of the original tar or the original material, then at some point you could test a small enough particle where you find uh, one million parts per million PCBs. You're going to find a pure piece of PCBs. This is a key point. So the maximum concentration of a contaminant in soil, it, it's easy now. That was always a big question we had when I was doing discrete sampling. But now if you think about it, it's either 1% if it's present or it's 100% if it's absent or 100% if it's present. <coughs> so the, the concept of maximum concentration of contaminant at a site in terms of discrete sample at individual points really is meaningless. It's either zero or 100%. Anything in between, you're just diluting it with soil. So the objective, again, is always to, to estimate the true or mean concentration for a specified area and volume of soil. And this is the, the heart of sampling theory. And you have to do that. You have to collect, designate your targeted volume of area of soil and then collect a representative sample, something we'll talk about in another presentation.
uh, a local chemist who likes to cook showed me how to make PCB nuggets in soil. We didn't use PCB oil. We used olive oil and dry flour. Try this at home. Just take some dry flour, spread it out real thinly, and dribble some olive oil on it. And watch what happens. Same thing happens probably when PCB mineral oil is dumped on the ground. It beads up and forms these little droplets. And then fairly quickly, the droplet is going to slowly, it's going to sink into the flour. And look what happens in the bottom left-hand corner is it sinks in. Around the outer edge of it, you get this thin outer rim that's wider than the stuff inside because it contains more of the flour. Just interesting, we saw the same thing on the microscope at the PCB site. Let this sit for a little while and then take a, a sieve and run the flour through it. And you'll find these olive oil infused nuggets in the sifted flour. So now think about this from a laboratory standpoint. You send them this sample of flour with these nuggets you probably haven't noticed in it. The laboratory for PCBs is going to test 10 grams of soil. If they happen to get a few of these little nuggets in what they test, they're going to get really high concentration of PCBs. If they happen not to have many nuggets or even any nuggets in the same sample, the 10 grams a spoonful they take out doesn't have any, they're going to get very low concentrations or even ND for PCBs. Always been a problem in the laboratory. Their data being represented in the sample and they were well aware of this. This is why confirmation samples fail or pass at a site. So in this example here, we have some initial investigation based on lots of discrete samples that were put out or collected at the site. Uh, we thought we had the extent of contamination identified, so we went and excavated it. Look in the upper left-hand corner, you see that little isolated excavated area. Real typical, you see with discrete sample data, these isolated hot spots. We'll look at that in a minute. Those are classic sign of small-scale variability, completely artificial. But you do your excavation, you think you have it all, you go back and collect some confirmation samples, and surprise, or probably not, if you've been doing this a long time, some of the confirmation samples fail. That's so what you do, you go out and dig a little bit more, and then you collect some more confirmation samples, and this can go on and on for multiple rounds. If you could zoom in on any particular spot where you're collecting a discrete confirmation sample, if you could see the contaminant concentrations in the soil in detail, then what you'd see is that it's, there can be totally random within some potentially broad range at that individual spot. So where you collected the sample, move it over an inch, you get a completely different number. Same thing within the sample itself. You can get a completely uh, different number testing the sample multiple times. So this, this problem with small scale variability and the randomness of the data that you get at any, in any given grid point, you can't fix it by collecting more and more discrete samples. You just dig yourself deeper into the rabbit hole. And eventually, you run out of money, and they either abandon the property or call it a day, or you think you have all the contamination. And maybe you do, maybe you don't. This example with these artificial hot spots we talked about. And again, what, look at these some of the sites you have with discrete sample data. We have a lot of data. And look, and you'll see these hot spots, I guarantee you. So in this case, here's our lead site. We have 24 grid points. Around each one of the grid points, or at each one of the grid points now, Based on our co-located samples and variability with individual samples, we can just roughly approximate what the concentration of lead might be in any given discrete sample collected to that grid point. So for example, grid point number 21 in the upper left-hand corner, looking at inter and intrust sample variability, we'd estimate discrete samples collected around this point could range in concentration of lead from 103 to 419 ppm. This isn't exact, it's just for example only, but these are real data. So we do that at every single grid point. What we did in using Excel is we put in the range of concentration of lead that estimated for each grid point, then had Excel pick a random number within that range, and then we turned it into a map. So the first figure you see here, the red exceeds 400 ppm, green is below 200 ppm, yellow is in the middle. You'll see some purple in a minute, over 800 ppm. Again, this is the, the type of map that we would get if we go out to this site and collected a single individual discrete sample at each grid point. So you see what looks like a, a nice pattern. Most of the contamination is on the right, kind of split up in different areas. You see these isolated hot spots and even cold spots. And you can, if you're a geologist like I am, you can come up with some stories why you think they might be isolated here at the, at the site. But now someone else goes back and collects another set of samples, and maybe you do it at the exact same grid points, maybe over, move it over a few inches, so again, we had Excel go back to the same points, collect another random number within that range, and here's what we get. So in this case, it's a completely different map. So now it looks like the site is much more contaminated than our initial set. 
our first set of discrete samples, we even have these really hot spots over 800 ppm. So something's really odd going on. So these, these map patterns being generated are completely artificial. And they're based on, this happened to reflect the sample data set that you collected. Again, you, we could go back to these grid points. If we did enough times, every cell would be green, every cell would be red, maybe even purple. Here's two more maps. <coughs> Again, real data going back to the same discrete, same grid points, collecting another discrete sample, we get different map patterns. Of course, we don't see this in the field because no one ever goes to a, a site like this and collects hundreds of discrete samples. You know, the same grid points and compares the data. But this is what's going on in a lot of sites. Here's four more maps. So you can see they kind of look similar, but when you look in close, all your hot spots and cold spots have shifted around. It's a classic sign of uh, small-scale heterogeneity. Key thing to remember here too, the, the mean concentration for any given set of discrete samples is changing every time you collect a new set of discrete samples from the same grid points. So think, think about that in terms of risk assessment. How, how accurate, how precise are these UCLs and means you're calculating in, in terms of uh, risk assessment. Mm. You can do the same thing with a, with a pair of dice, or just one dice in this case. So each one of the grid points we're going to roll the dice uh, so we can get a value between 1 and 6. Now, every single grid point is the same. The average is 3.5 die. <coughs> but since we're just rolling the dice one time, we can, uh, again, I used Excel. It picked a random number between 1 and 6, assigned it to each grid point, and you're going to get some kind of pattern. That's the thing with discrete samples. You'll get a pattern, but even though it could be entirely artificial, which it, obviously in this case it is because every single grid cell has the same dice on it. So the pattern is totally artificial, and again, the mean changes between rolls. Here's a second roll. I'll say we have lots of sixes pop up. We might think we have a concentration of sixes in the middle of the, our dice field. <coughs> you see these isolated hot spots and cold spots through it. Roll the dice again, we get another set of patterns. Again, it's, you can make a story out of this uh, from a contamination standpoint. It's completely false, completely artificial. Let's roll the dice four more times. Interesting, in the bottom left-hand corner, now it's getting really green. We happen to roll a lot of ones. If we did this enough times, every cell would come up one. The whole thing's green. The average is one. If we did it again enough times, every cell would come black. Six. The average is six. So what's true? Well, none of them are true. We don't really know which one is because we can't see the dice in the field when we're picking our discrete samples. <coughs> Think about this in terms of risk assessment. At the, this is back to the lead side. Again, this is real data. If we uh, take the lowest concentration of lead detected reported for each grid point or estimated for each grid point. Then the mean is 131 ppm. It's below our action level of 200. RSD, 58 percent, a little bit high. So it tells us you know, not so, a little bit uncertainty in the data. 95th percent UCL, 157. So still below our action level. You're done at the site based on this set of data. That's what if we use the highest concentration of, of lead. Uh, reported samples, discrete samples for each grid point. Now suddenly the mean is 452 ppm, RSD 64%, 95% UCL 559. So now it's above our action level. So which is it? Is this site contaminated you know, above our action level or not? Which one of these numbers are right? Is it somewhere near the median? Well, we have no idea in reality. Something that uh, statisticians, friends of mine, have really drilled into me is the problem from a field standpoint. I think the field people don't need training in statistics, but the statisticians and risk assessors need training in field sampling also. But a statistician told me the statistics only evaluates the precision of the test employed to evaluate the data provided. From their standpoint, risk assessor or whatever, they can't say anything about whether your data are representative of your field area. That's up to you, the person that collected the samples to begin with. All they can tell you is give you an idea of the precision of their estimate of the mean, their UCL, based on the data you provided. They can't directly verify the field representative of a single set of data. The only way to do that is to go back and collect another set of data. Even then, with replicates for discrete samples, even if they tend to match up or don't match up, you can't really be sure which set is real and what the variability is, unless they're collected properly with discrete sample with the sampling theory. Well, another thing I might have done for my risk assessor side, even though it really bothered my site investigation geologist side, how do we reduce these RSDs and in theory, or not even in theory, just in play really, get higher confidence in the data. We'll just exclude the outlier data. 
But this really has, has never been valid, even though it's in a lot of guidance I know. But for soil, it's invalid, doesn't work. Just, just think about that a little bit more. About ignoring the outliers, here's a, again, quoting US EPA 1989 methods for evaluating the attainment of cleanup standards. People knew these were problems 30 years ago, but they persisted since. All data not known to be in error should be considered valid. So unless the laboratory says our equipment was really messed up these days, we can't uh, validate the, the accuracy of the data. You have to use it. High concentrations are of particular concern for their potential health and environmental impact. Uh, Francis Pittard, 2009, he's the, sort of the godfather of sampling theory for particulate matter, looking for you know, gold or ore, even contamination in soil. A common error, and in this case he's talking about environmental work, has been to reject outliers that cannot be made to fit a statistical model. The tendency has been to make the data fit a preconceived model instead of searching for a more appropriate way to collect the samples. So think about this. The, in terms of representative data, you have to include outliers and hotspots. If you exclude them, your data are no longer representative of the site where you collected it. So capturing and representing isolated hotspots within a targeted area so is critical to accurate interpretation of the data. Think about this back to my geology side. If no one would ever do this now, but they wouldn't have a job long if they did. But say a geologist went out to a mountain they thought might have gold and collected lots of discrete pieces of rock and had them tested. And some of the pieces of rock came out pure gold. But so then they just, with the RSDs are high on your data, what do you do? I'm just going to eliminate the, the samples that came back pure gold and make some estimate of the concentration of gold in this mountain. Well, they'd be fired in a heartbeat. Two reasons. One, for doing something like ignoring veins of gold in a mountain that you're hoping to exploit for gold, and even collecting and testing individual discrete samples, which they would never do anymore. So gold miners love outliers. That's what drives economic viability. Risk assessors also should be loving outliers, or not loving them, but respecting them. For example, in this backyard, say you're testing for lead or for PCBs, and you collect, maybe you collect 10 samples or 15 samples, which from a financial standpoint gets to be a lot of money. And uh, one or two or three samples in the yard come back really high in PCBs, and say the sample over by the swing set, really high in PCBs. So what do you do? Your RSD is really high. You're not that you know, confident in the precision of the estimated mean. So you ignore the sample that was over by the swing set with high PCBs. This happens quite a bit. Makes no sense at all in the field, never has. But that's really all a statisticians need to do if you want to you know, try to get some idea of higher confidence in the data they're providing you. So again, it's up to the field people, not them, to determine whether or not it's appropriate to exclude that data. Problem has never been with statisticians, or even with risk assessors, I would say. It's with how we were collecting samples, back to my geology side. Well, what's another way we deal with outliers? We just excavate them. So think about this again. Let's go back to the lead site. Again, here's our first set of data we have. Let's say we're going to use a cleanup level. This made this your backyard at 400 ppm. So we collect one set of discrete samples, and the, the red areas are where it's over 400 ppm. We think we see a nice pattern, higher concentrations of lead on the right-hand side of my yard, and then you get this odd outlier, which you'll make some story up about why it happens to be there. So then you go through and excavate this area. Then it, to confirm this, uh, you go back and collect confirmation samples in every single grid that you didn't excavate. So what do you find? Again, this is real data. So in this case, a big surprise, or probably not if you've been doing this a while, and two of the cells at the top left-hand corner that originally came up clean, now all of a sudden your discrete confirmation samples you collected there are both over 400 ppm. So what happened there? That's, that's pretty odd. And then down in the bottom part, another cell that initially was clean is over 400 ppm. And then you have this hot spot that's suddenly almost 1,000 ppm, where your first sample was 321 ppm in the center right. So what do you do? Well, you talk to your client, say, it looks like we need to do some more excavation. It takes six months to get a proposal accepted, then for them to come up with the funds, you go back out, excavate those hot spots, then resample what's left again. And here's another surprise. One of the earlier uh, spots at two times in a row was below your cleanup level 400 ppm is suddenly above it. So what do you do? Well, sorry, client. Sorry, property manager. I'm going to have to go excavate this again. So you excavate that. And then you resample, again, every grid cell, a new set of discrete samples. And wow, here's another hot spot. It's 407 ppm before it was clean. This goes on and on and on. And again, 
maybe eventually you'll, all the sa- your confirmation samples will come up clean. But if you went back and did it again, you, know, you might be surprised and some of them come up contaminated again. It's just random. Potentially they all come up clean or all come up contaminated. At some point, the, the client, the property owner, you either think you clean up the site and you're done. Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. At some point, they just get frustrated. They run out of money and they walk away from the property and get a brownfield. That's something just important to remember. This this is what this random heterogeneity is really what causing us so much problems in the field. And resampling of the full area might show no risk, but or it may show continued risk, but still could be wrong. And another reason to collect discrete samples in is we work through this. These are examples that we all went through in our office over the 10 or 15 years we've been doing this. You know, why should we collect discrete samples? Some argument, trying to make a case why we need to. The one that often comes up is the what's really an impossible search for an acute decision at volume of soil with the, using discrete samples or some small spot of soil. So let's think about this. Here's a front yard of somebody's house, 20 feet by 20 feet, so a really small spot. Here's some hypothetical regulatory requirement, which actually uh, a state, in a particular state, is considering including their, in their guidance. No single discrete sample in the upper three inches, say, of this yard of soil shall exceed 400 ppm lead due to short-term risk. Let's just assume the 400 ppm is short-term risk is accurate in the risk assessors. That's something important to them. So let's think about that in detail now, switching back to the geology side. What exactly are they telling me to do and to try to demonstrate but the total mass of soil we're talking about in 20 foot by 20 foot area, three inches of soil, about 3,000 kilograms. So what exactly does is the risk assessor telling me for a, what's a discrete sample? Or a, in really, reality, we call this a decision. It's a volume of soil we need to make a decision on, or mass of soil. Well, maybe it's a discrete sample I've put in my four ounce jar, about 100 grams. How many of those are in that front yard, that small area? About 30,000 potential sample size decision units or masses of soil, 100 gram masses. So I'm supposed to sample this front yard and with some degree of confidence to say no, none of these 30,000 potential 100 gram masses of soil exceeds 400 ppm lead. How do I do that? How many samples do I need to collect? There's ways to do it, but it, we're talking about tens and tens, and lots and lots of samples, and even that could go up. That's just to start with. It'll never, no one would ever do that in a small one area. And 100 grams with the laboratory data isn't representative of the sample I sent anyway. So really we're talking about the mass they tested. They'd say it's one gram. That's a typical laboratory subsample mass. Well, now I'm up to 3 million potential one gram discrete masses of soil in this front yard that I'm supposed to demonstrate no single one of those exceeds 400 ppm. Well, how many samples do I need to collect now? What kind of confidence did I give you? Three or four or five discrete samples? 10, maybe I test 10 random one gram masses of soil out of 3 million. You know what? You would never have any, uh, any degree of confidence that the other millions of potential one gram masses you didn't test are less than 400 ppm. And they have nothing to do with risk anyway. In terms of risk, default child ingestion rate, let's say it's 200 milligrams, maybe it's 100 milligrams, somewhere in that range of soil every day. Now we're talking about 15 million potential. 200 milligram masses of soil in this front yard. How many of those do I need to test to demonstrate to the regulator no single discrete mass exceeds 400 ppm? Well, that's, think about that. It, it can't be done. And, but really, we're talking about short-term risk. We should be focusing on pica kids, pica children. A pica child is someone who tends to put lots of things in their mouth, including dirt. Average ingestion rate at one time for a pica child, about 10 grams, a spoonful of dirt the kid might eat. Now, how many of these are in this front yard? About 300,000, a little bit less than 15 million. But again, impossible to collect enough samples, but definitely within finance is typically available to demonstrate with any reasonable level of confidence. There's no individual discrete 10 gram mass over 400 ppm. So the reality is, first thing to keep in mind is that acute toxicity factors and soil screening levels aren't even available for most contaminants. Maybe they are for lead. There's a lot of debate over that. There's, there could be for lead, definitely. So there's no screening levels to compare your discrete data to anyway to look at acute toxicity concerns. But more importantly, it's just not feasible to negate the presence of any single small mass of acutely toxic soil with any degree of confidence based on using either discrete data or even multi-increment sample data. You're, just, you're never going to be able to test such a, a large mass of soil enough to demonstrate that. If you think you have potential concerns at the site, 
you go back to your conceptual site model, it's really critical to understand what you think is going on at the site. If you think there might be little bits of lead shot or lead-based paint or something in that yard, all you can really do to address a potential short-term acute risk is scrape the yard or cap it. Now imagine that if you have a grassy backyard, if I come by and toss a little piece of 50 milligram lead shot into that yard, that's high enough to cause potential short-term risk in terms of blood lead levels, at least in theory. Now good luck finding that in your front yard with the discrete samples, you never will. So what all you can do is scrape the yard, cap it. If you scrape it, then you can go back designate your target exposure area and collect a proper multi-increment sample, one sample from many, many points, a, a large mass, and use that to evaluate chronic risk. And then based on your conceptual site model, you have to make some calls on whether or not you think any acute risk could still be present at the site. So what does contamination in soil really look like? If you could see PCB contamination in soil or arsenic or lead or anything, what would it look like? Not I've mentioned in several workshops, the only artist I remember of my college days of art class was this guy named Jackson Pollock, kind of maybe a, because in the end I would end up looking like him in terms of my hairstyle on top of it. But Pollock was very famous for splatter painting. So you see the picture here on the left. If you zoom in, that red dot is uh, about the size of a discrete soil sample. I used his foot when I zoomed in to make it this size. So imagine this, move that red dot around that black square and the black is PCBs and the white is clean or cleaner, non-PCBs. Imagine the variability in the concentration of PCBs in that sample as you move it around that area. It'd be, it could be extremely variable, just like you see in the examples in the field. Or how about it in the case on the right? This is a milk truck that flipped over. You see the milk ran down the side of the hill, following little low-level, low-lying areas. And look at how heterogeneous it is. Again, the red dot is about the size of a four ounce jar that someone might collect some discrete samples. Let's say they couldn't see the milk. But a key thing they would do, if they put in enough discrete samples, they're gonna find the core of the contamination where any sample is gonna, pay, is gonna fail and identify some contamination. So we see that at the sites where we have discrete soil sample data and we've gone back using more reliable multi increment sample data. Typically, discrete soil samples, they catch the core of the contamination, but move that red dot outside where all the white is the more variable areas, you're going to get pretty confused. You're going to get confused pretty quickly there. It's just hit and miss whether you find anything. You might, the, the, you might come up hot. You think you found some isolated hot spot of milk. You, maybe you dig that out, collect confirmation samples around it. It looks good. In reality, you just, uh, you're just kind of lost in the heterogeneity. This is probably what contamination looks like in the subsurface, too, from a leaking underground tank. You get this anastomosing channels of, of contaminant liquids moving down through the soil. Imagine drilling through this at two or three boreholes. The contaminant concentrations could be really hit and miss. You'll find the core area again, but in areas that are still contaminated, still could co pose concerns, it'd be really easy to get false negatives. And you get lost with these positives, which you think are just isolated pockets. So the whole problem with discrete samples is pretty simple. Discrete soil samples are too small to overcome small scale heterogeneity contaminants in soil. And again, I stole this, this uh, cartoon from Gary Lawson. I changed the top. I forget what it originally said, but it's a bird. You're sitting on the back of an elephant. The problem with discrete samples is you're zoomed in too close. You're trying to make calls based on tiny one gram or five gram or 10 gram masses of soil. When the decisions from a risk standpoint have never been for this size mass of soil, they've always been for large areas. You know, it's 20 foot by 20 foot or your backyard or a football field or even acres of land. The discrete soil sample or screening levels were never intended to apply to individual discrete samples. So several people listening in might know I've been uh, working on with some people in the Chinese Academy of Sciences on the same issues, how to kind of avoid the problems we've been dealing with the last 30 years in our site investigation methods, which, again, we catch a lot of contamination. Obviously, we've done a lot of really good remediation, but how can we improve this method and make it more efficient? They don't have the time. They can't spend five or ten years cleaning up sites. We're, we've translated most of our guidance now into Chinese. But I like this example that someone there came up with. You know, what we thought in the 1980s was a contaminated soil was like a bowl of steamed rice, a bowl of white rice. So in this case, the con contaminant concentrations uh, are identical regardless of where the sample is collected. Any one of these circled spots, you're going to get the same number. Even the mass doesn't really matter. You just need to collect enough to send to the laboratory to test whatever they need.
the testing of any given small mass of soils can be representative of the area of contamination or clean as a whole. So what we've learned in the last 30 years is that contaminated soil is more like a bowl of fried rice. So in this case, think about this if, if you're concerned about peas, maybe you're allergic, chronic allergy to peas. So what's the, first, what's the maximum concentration of, of green pea in this bowl of egg fried rice? Well, if you could zoom in and pluck out a small enough particle from this bowl of rice, and it, it happens to be a green pea, well, the maximum concentration, if it's there, is always going to be a million parts per million. If there is no green pea in this bowl of rice, then the concentration is 0%. Anything in between, you're just diluting it with other stuff in the bowl. Same thing with PCBs or any contaminant in soil. So now, it, in some of this kind of situation with small-scale heterogeneity, it becomes really critical then how we collect the sample. You can't just collect it from one point. You need to collect it from many points. And you also have to collect a big handful, a big massive sample. And this is, this is the essence of sampling theory. There are equations out there based on particle size, particle shape, and the concentration of contaminant you're looking for and other, several other factors. You plug that in, and the, the model actually tells you the mass of soil you need to collect. Typically for environmental work we do when you're looking at low PPM concentrations of contaminants in soil potentially, you need to collect at least one or two kilograms of soil from any targeted area, whatever your targeted area happens to be, size of football field, sandbox in your backyard, same thing. One to two kilogram mass of soil from lots of points. So it, it's someone said, and we all went through and we made this transition, those of us who have been doing this for years, so you're, so you're telling me my discrete sample data are completely useless? Well, not, not at all, really. You, you can still use discrete sample data to identify large-scale patterns. They can be very real. This is an example here, nine-acre site in Hawaii. They're going to develop for a residential use. Actually, people from our office, again, we have our own field team. And that's one reason why we we're so far ahead of this, because we have to go out do our own sampling every year. It's part of our job. But we went out and collected multi-increment samples from 5,000 square foot areas where we thought the main arsenic contamination at this site would be. In this particular site, they used to mix arsenic and make a weed killer for sugarcane fields. Well, our, our MI samples kept coming back super high with arsenic. We were right in the middle of it. It was going to take us forever to map this area out. So a consultant went back, designated 90 points, and at each one of the points, he collected a discrete sample, but he collected it from multiple points around each individual grid point because he knew that you could get heterogeneity around an individual point. He collected several hundred grams of soil, and then he, you know, mechanically mixed it, whatever that did. But the main thing was he shot each sample multiple times with the portable XRF until he was confident he knew the concentration of arsenic in that particular sample. And then he mapped out large-scale patterns of arsenic contamination at the site. Worked worked beautifully. We always see this. We see three areas of contamination. One is, uh, you see in level area A, it's really you can't miss. Every spoonful, every pinch of soil in that area A is contaminated above levels of concern. Easily picked up with the discrete samples. Area B, though, you start getting that heterogeneity, and it's really hit or miss. Some of the samples come up hot. You start getting all these isolated hot spots and cold spots. If you tested another pinch or discrete sample a few inches or feet away, you might get completely different. So area B is what really messes up in the field where you have this small scale random variability that you can't really trust and you get all these isolated map patterns. Area C though at this site is again, it's all real data. All the individual discrete samples came up clean. Pretty high confidence that this area, area C is gonna be clean. This is great. In this case, one thing they could do at this site, they're still talking about it, just using the discrete sample data, excavating out or dealing with all the heavily contaminated spots, areas. But then they're going to go back, divide the area up into decision units, lot, basically are the lots they're going to use on the site, and collect proper, very rigorous multi increment samples on each one of those lots. And they'll collect replicates in one or more of those lots just to verify the precision of it. So discrete samples can be useful. Another example, PCBs. You see the same pattern, all these isolated hot spots and even cold spots here. But hundreds of discrete samples collected at this site. The, when they did this, again, nine or ten acres, they, they knew the problems with discrete samples, but they intentionally used this to identify, try to localize where the PCB contamination was across this site ahead of time to help them set up a proper decision at multi increment sampling approach. And they used immunoassay kits to save all money. So you see what, what you see here, it looks like most contamination is over on the left. You get a few isolated spots, 
Again, these individual spots you see here could be completely artificial, just based on small scale variability. But the large scale patterns are real. So what does this really look like? This is the actual resolution of that discrete sample data. Definitely not down to the individual sample point, but you, you do definitely have these areas, large areas that seem to be you know, impacted above their cleanup level for this site of 10 ppm. Then you have these large green areas where it looks like the mean PCBs is probably below 10 ppm. You get, again, here's these isolated hot spots scattered within here. That something's going on around here. You don't have a lot of confidence exactly what's going on. But in this case, they use this data I think they actually did some initial cleanup, then they went back and split the site up into decision units and collected proper multi-ancient samples in each decision unit. So the discrete sample data helped them speed up the process, but you just can't rely on the data for final decision making. So why did this take 30 years to figure out? And this is pretty simple. This isn't, I'd say, you know, rocket science, but this is pretty simple. The variability around the individual grid point can be really high. We suspected that for years, but never tested it. So it, the problem is, here's a report published 2002, Guidance on Environmental Data Verification and Data Validation. We hear a lot in our work about data validation. We have to validate our data. We never hear the term verification. So what does this mean? It's not necessarily discussed in this document because when they wrote it, the people that wrote it didn't really understand the problems with small-scale heterogeneity at the time. But verification, we should really be thinking of is the sample I collected is represented the targeted area. That's what verification is, implies. Validation, I like to think of as the lab data so the data I get back from the laboratory for the sample I sent is representative of the sample that I sent them. So those two key parts, data verification, validation, we've never done it in 30 years. Now when we talk about data validation, the guidance is focused on validation of laboratory analytical method. That's all they're testing. They're just validating their equipment was running properly. Where again, most of the error, and they've known this for 20 years, is probably in how the sample was collected in the field and how that subsample was collected in the laboratory for testing. The rigorous validation and verification of field representative of sample data has never really been explored in the environment industry. It has been in the agriculture and mining industries, but they find out real quickly if their data are bad just from, or unreliable just from failed mine operations or failed crops. The problem is there's no comparable obvious repercussions in the environment industry to find out that your data are unreliable, unless someone happens to go back and recheck the site using a more rigorous methods, decision, multi-ancient sampling methods, or even go back with a separate set of discrete samples, retest the site. Nobody ever really does that. We've always just made the call based on what we had. People were thinking about this, again, since the 1980s. That if you read back through the old documents that Dina Crumling and I looked through, numerous warnings that, hey, these are just quick assumptions. Somebody needs to go back and test this in the field. We, we, again, we should have done this. I should have done it 25 years ago instead of waiting until just a few years ago. Here's a labor US EPA laboratory uh, sample processing guidance, guidance for obtaining representative laboratory analytical subsamples from particulate laboratory samples from soil, published in 2003. Uh, now these, the, the people who wrote this guidance had caught on to sampling theory, G sampling theory, and understand the problems. But look at some of the quotes in the introduction. Historically, the focus of EPA's work was on the analytical method, validation, and sampling, either subsampling or in the field, was taken for granted. It became clear that sampling is the major source of error in the measurement process, not the analytical method. And classical statistical sampling theory was not adequate for such samples. What they're saying here is you can't just collect lots of individual discrete samples or even subsamples and then run statistical tests on them and think you're coming up with the right answer. The problems are beyond that. It's the, it's the key problems in how the samples are actually collected in mass and such. So I like this quote, we search for non-conventional statistical sampling theory, non-conventional in the environmental world. It's conventional in agriculture and mining for decades. That takes into account the nature of particulate materials. And in 1989, almost 30 years ago, we hit pay dirt. Uh, Pierre G sampling theory for particulate materials. So this guidance recommends when you get a, a laboratory gets a sample, they need to spread the sample out dry it, sieve it, and then subsample it very carefully, collecting the aliquot subsample for testing from many, many spots within your sample and testing that. And there's a minimum mass associated with that. For less than two millimeter particles, it's 10 grams, not one gram we use in metals to get a minimum you need to get a representative subsample. So they knew about it, but no one really ever paid attention to this guidance for whatever reason. There are a lot of these out there.
So there are multiple red flags since the 1990s, even late 1980s. Hey, this discrete sampling method, there's some serious problems with it. We need to look at it in general, but because there's no obvious repercussion in the field, no obvious problem in the field, it, it just wasn't looked at very closely. Here's another quote, 1992, preparation of soil sampling protocols. 1992, here's one of the problems we talked about in the other workshops. The, the original sampling theory by Pierre G was written in French. It wasn't translated into English, at least widespread, until 1993, which was five or six or seven years after we'd already started preparing a guidance for testing contaminated soils. At that time, in English, what was out there was mostly for testing industrial waste, like we talked about at the beginning. Just collect a small mass, whatever lab needs from any spot, and you'll figure it out if it's contaminated or not. So 1992, particulate sampling theory is new to most environmental investigators, even though the techniques used to apply the theory to soil sampling are familiar. This guy could read French, and he read Pierre G's original work. He said, hey, we need to think about this more. But you know, by then, the, unfortunately, the idea was it's getting too late. So that's the problems with discrete soil sampling. So one point, I'll emphasize this again later, is this whole idea of sampling theory and multi increment sampling methods is not, it wasn't developed as a potential alternative to discrete soil sampling uh, approaches. It was intentionally developed to address these specific problems that we're, we've been discussing. So you know, the next presentation that we, we give should be on sampling theory, I think. Let's get into this in more detail. Some of the terminology you've always heard me use, already heard me use, and you'll hear it uh, later on in this committee. Uh, there's several different terms out for what this approach is. In Hawaii, we use the term multi-increment sample, which I'll show you in a minute why I think that's the most appropriate for this. Multi-increment sample, it's a registered trademark by Chuck Ramsey with Envirostat. Chuck's the, the leading guru of sampling for, for soils and other things in the U.S., really. <coughs> but Chuck's been teaching classes on how to properly collect soil samples for several decades. He was, he was worried in some of his classes people were collecting samples improperly in the field, not processing in the laboratory, still calling them multi-increment samples and referencing his uh, workshops and guidance. So he trademarked the term just to, to force people to do it properly if they're going to use that term. So other terms that come out in 2010, the ITRC set up the incremental sampling methodology workshop ISM. They used ISM because they didn't want to deal with, with the trademark on MIS. So several people from Hawaii, including myself, were on that team. At that time, we didn't have a good set of discrete soil sample that, uh, data to look at like we just went through here. A lot of it was still th theoretical or we had some few examples of co-located samples that seemed to match, but I have to say we didn't completely get the, the details in the field. We were focusing especially on theory. So you hear the term ISM. Uh, also now we're using the term incremental sampling, trying to move away from the idea of ISM. So, you know, it's a useful document introduction, ITRCs, but some parts are outdated. Some of the conclusions and methods used to verify sampling theory really weren't appropriate. You also hear a term composite sampling. Uh, we definitely don't use the com term composite sampling. We consider it a, a slang term applies to mixing a soil from different areas intentionally, at least in some regulatory respects, although some people still use that. And ISC, incremental compa composite sampling. And if we have to stick to a term that's not trademarked, I like the term incremental sampling, although it's, it's actually exact opposite of what we're trying to do in the field. We're, we're trying to get away from doing these investigations incrementally, step by step by step. We're trying to get in and get out. That's one reason that we definitely prefer MIS. That's terminology. I'm just going to give a few examples of how this works, but outside references we can talk about later. Uh, Envirostat is Chuck Ramsey's company. He's been teaching these classes for decades. He does a lot of work with food sampling, things people really care about, even surface water. So he teaches a four-day detailed introduction to sampling theory and multi-increment sampling investigations. Actually, multi-increment, I just noticed, shouldn't have a hyphen in between there. Francis Petard, he's the, the, the godfather of sampling theory in general. He mostly focuses on mining these days, but he teaches advanced statistical sampling concepts. I'm in this ITRC's guidance. Good introduction. Uh, it's getting outdated. It's got some problems, but it, it's a good way to get started in this if you haven't already. And this, of course, in addition to our guidance, which combines all these together. And it's real quick review just to share an idea of the difference between discrete sampling and multi increment sampling, just as a prep for the future presentations. Here's an idea. Typical example of, say, discrete soil sampling methods. We have some suspect area at this property that we think might be contaminated. You know, in our minds, we draw a line around it. We didn't do this in the field, but we've always had this concept of decision units. We draw a line around where we think it's, the soil might be contaminated. 
we maybe collect one or a couple samples in there. And then we put samples around where we think it's where the contamination ends. And these are our confirmation samples. So this, again, this, we had this idea of spatial distribution of contamination. We just didn't know that term of uh, decision units. How many samples should I collect here? That's always a question when I was a consultant doing field work. It's pretty easy in the field because by the time the field people get this, you, you, the number of samples to collect is your lab budget divided by the cost per sample. And there's no science behind that. That's just the money I had to collect samples, and you try to space them out best you can based on what you have. And you'd always like to have more samples, but here's what I'm stuck with. You're also often stuck with a high laboratory cost. Here's how this would work under a decision unit and multi-increment sample approach. Is we still, again, we, this time we're physically in the field going to draw a line around this, these different areas. So we physically draw a line around the area we suspect is, could be contaminated, a spill area, a source area, an ITRC's document. And that's our decision. We're going to make a decision on whether or not that area is contaminated above potential concerns. We might split that spill area up into smaller DUs based on remediation concerns. Hopefully we can isolate the contamination in one area or the other. And then we would collect, then to collect a sample now, we're not just going to collect one random, or even a couple of random four ounce jars of dirt from here. Sampling theory, we have to collect one, two kilograms of soil from at least 30, better 50, and even PCBs and stuff, even 75 points within that targeted area. If we combine all these increments of soil together, they're going to weigh 20, 30, 40 grams each into a single sample. So it's a sample. It's not a composite. We're just collecting a, a, a single sample from a targeted area. And then around the suspect contaminated areas, we designate what we call, in our guidance, perimeter to use which we anticipate are going to come up clean. So we isolate the contamination in one area. Obviously, a lot of thought has to go in and making the spill area small enough to isolate contamination, but not too small that uh, your perimeter DUs you hope will be clean, come up contaminated, because that's going to make you go back and do additional work. Each one of the DUs, you collect a single multi-increment sample from many, many points. Send that to the laboratory. In one of the DUs, typically in a single spill scenario, in the hottest area, you're going to collect three separate samples from individual points within there, and you're going to test the field precision of your data or the total precision. You see that in the bottom corner, there's three bags from this site. So here's what this might look like in the end. Again, this is just hypothetical. But say the three of the, you, you definitely found your contamination, so good job on, uh, on looking in the past history and such and identifying suspect contaminated areas. Three of your perimeter DUs come up clean, just like you're hoping they would, but one of them, your DU4, comes up hot. So you didn't quite get it right on that side. You should have e extended the spill area at DU out a little bit further. But at least now, it's giving you a fairly clear endpoint to the sampling. Go back, think more about the site, look at the site, and then eventually you're going to designate additional perimeter DUs to the right of DU4. Collect a single MI sample on each one of them, properly collect it again. And then you want to get your outer DU definitely far enough away this time that you're highly confident it'll be clean. So just one more event and you're done. So there's a very clear endpoint now to the, your investigation and your data much more reliable. And this sample, the data you see here below in the spill area, we're going to collect triplicate samples. We'll be highly confident of that area. Or maybe that's somebody's backyard or a proposed playground. From a risk standpoint, we really want, we want replicate data to, so we're very confident of the precision. At this particular site, this was the arsenic site with, in fine-grained soils, our replicate sample from this area, 149, 140, 179, and 135, three separate samples to collect, collected across this area. Very close, RSD, 16%, excellent. 95% UCL, which we wouldn't use, but you can look at that, 192 ppm. So again, like I said, with each one of these site, study sites, we collected triplicate multi-increment samples. So let's look at the data here. Uh, each for the lead and arsenic sites, we collected 54 increment samples, so one to two kilogram samples from 54 points within those areas. And look at our sample data now. RSDs for the arsenic site, 6.5%. Very confident of the collecting a sample across that area that we're going to get you know, a very good number. Lead site, more variability, but a 54 increment sample. And our cutoff for these type of sites with more heterogeneity is at least 40 or 50 increments. Again, nailed it here. The RSD only 20%, anything under 35% is considered highly reliable data. <clears throat> so you see 240 to 350 ppm, we definitely have a problem at that site. Well, at the PCB site, so sample A, MI sample from 60 points, 
because we knew we had problems with PCBs. I think this site was about 5,000 square feet, somewhere in that area. Typical backyard. First sample, 24 ppm. Second sample, 19 ppm. It's looking pretty good. Third sample, 270 ppm. So by collecting replicate samples, what they're telling us is that our field procedures, our sampling method, was had some problems with it. We, we did the RSD for this site, 138%. Now, of course, my field geologist standpoint or side comes back in, and I actually help collect these samples. I think I collected the one that was 270. What do you do from a field standpoint? Well, you blame the laboratory. They screwed up that sample. So we actually had the laboratory go back and test each one of these samples again because they, maybe they subsampled it wrong. Maybe they got a little nugget of PCBs in sample C, or maybe they missed them. They didn't get a representative subsample in A and B. And the so the laboratory retested the samples, came out with almost the exact same numbers. So it's not laboratory error. This was field error in the field. So you know, representative, data representative, the first thing you look at is how the samples were collected. You don't look at the RSD. You look at how the samples were collected. Did you collect it from enough points? Did you collect enough mass? How did you actually collect it in the field? Second point, second step, then you look at the reproducibility, or at least targeting in a batch test way of your MI data for different DUs, at least test 10% of them, if they're all the same scenario, to collect replicate samples. If you have different spill scenarios, whatever, you have to collect multiple replicate sets. So how do I improve the precision of the data on my study site C? First thing I'll do is, if I go back to the site, split it up into smaller areas. Maybe there are some isolated areas of contamination within there. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. So split it up into smaller DUs. The next step under sampling theory, it's all about mass. You want to collect a larger sample. And you also want to collect it from a larger number of increments. Now, ideally, you'd even get the laboratory to test a larger mass of soil from that, the samples you send in. That's how you improve the precision of your data. But at least with multi-increment sampling data, I, I identified I had a problem in the field, which I never would have known if I just collected a single set of discrete samples. I could have had s discrete samples from A, B, or C. I never know if they're precise, they're reliable. So that's pretty much it. And in the end, this sampling stuff, collecting the samples in the field, it can be physically challenging, but you can do it. I mean, it's, you, need, you have to do it if you want reliable data. And it all comes down to how you designate your decision. It's how do you draw a line around areas to collect a sample from. And that's what we'll talk about in a, another presentation. We have a completely separate webinar and presentation from our webinars we did in June of this year, just specifically on decision. It's lots and lots of different real life examples of how sites were split up into decision units for sampling. So check that out on our YouTube station. Decision unit, what is it in the first place? We've always had this concept in the field, suspect spill area. Hey, here's my exposure area from a risk assessment standpoint. Best definition of a decision unit is the volume of soil or sediment, water, air, apples, whatever you would send to the lab as a single sample if possible. You typically can't do this, so you have to collect a representative sample from that area. And the only way to get representative samples is through sampling theory. So that's it, the future presentations, I think, for this group, next steps. You know, I like the idea of recording these and posting them just so we can get all our notes down. We need to talk more about how decision is to designate it. Definitely look more in detail what is sampling theory, what is multi-increment sample or incremental sampling, whatever you want to call it. It's used to characterize decision. It's, we need to talk about laboratory processing of MI samples most frustrating thing when we got started a lot of laboratories couldn't process the samples so we spent all this time in the field getting really good samples and then they sent it to the lab and they opened up the bag now we get our samples in one or two gallon ziploc bags and they test a pinch of soil that's ruins the whole process and then we, we need to talk also more details about how to collect these samples in the field how do you overcome these field challenges how do you deal with VOCs but how do you deal with subsurface soils it can be done we've been doing it for years but we have a lot of experience, good and bad, that's included in our guidance. We also need to focus on getting regulatory concurrence for the standalone use of DUMIS methods or equivalent, especially under RICRA, especially under TOSCA. We've been trying to get this done for years. Under TOSCA, there's all this discrete sampling stuff, which now we know is, can be highly unreliable. At, at best, it's highly inefficient, wasteful time and money. But under TOSCA, there's a specific risk-based disposal approval that allows you to come up with alternative sampling methods. So you know, when they were doing this work back in the 80s, again, they knew they had to put this together really quickly. They knew there could be a potential problem. So they gave you an out in the regulations. And that's what this risk-based approach is. You don't try to fix a discrete sampling method. You can't. But 
still, like I think what we did in Hawaii, let people use discrete samples during this transition period to make their initial calls on remediation and such. We don't go back and look at old sites that are already closed. And we did what we could with what we had and save it. Sites that are in process, go ahead and use your discrete sampling data, set up remediation and such, but go back and start confirming with multi increment sample data. And in that, you know, sometimes you're going to be right, sometimes a lot more times you expect you're going to get surprised. But it's something we need to get done. We need it in writing on EPA letterhead that it's approved, uh, okay to use. Otherwise, it's costing companies in Hawaii, and I know on the mainland, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars having to collect both sets of samples. It's the attorneys and the financiers want MI data. They're, a lot of them already know the problems with discretes before they put up money for some. So that's it. Any questions? And I'd like to state a lot of these are notes to myself. You know, the wrong question to ask is what types of sites are DU, MIS, or incremental sampling approaches applicable to? They're applicable to all sites. We should be using this at all sites, if nothing else, for confirmation. Actually, that's, that's, the, that's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is knowing what we know now about how unreliable discrete samples can be, or at least uh, the, the range and reliability, the, the potential error within individual samples, which type of sites, if any, and I can't think of any, but let's talk about that, should discrete sample data be acceptable as standalone in the absence of confirmation MI or incremental sampling data. So a key point to make here, it doesn't come across in the ITRC ISM guidance because at the time we didn't really have a good grasp on it, but uh, uh, this DU, MIS, or incremental sampling, whatever you want to call it, it's not just another tool in the toolbox you might use at some sites. It's entirely new, or it's not that new in reality. It's 50 years old, but it's it's an improved set of tools that's intended to replace discrete sampling methods and make this whole process much more efficient economically and in terms of time so you can get in and get out, cleaning up these sites, not let them drag out for years with a high degree of like, confidence that nobody's going to come back 10 years down the road and retest the site and find problems. So thanks a lot. I know this is drug out a little bit, but it's, this is where we have to start. And now we can move on to more details of what is sampling theory and how do we do this in the field.